Hello, good evening. This is to uh, introduce the talk on evidence of music in Harappan civilization and the possible interactions with the Mesopotamian civilization. So in this talk we are going to have Mr. Shail Vyas who is a, a well-known musician who has carried out independent projects and also done several uh, music compositions and uh, he has done a remarkable work on the understanding of music and music systems during the Harappan civilization and also it's possible uh, possible interactions with the Mesopotamian civilization, possible uh, uh, transformations and the adaptations uh, undertook by the Mesopotamians. Uh, his research is uh, uh, based on uh, several factors, uh, based on the uh, depiction of several music instruments on uh, 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 low relief uh, uh, narrative tablets and also uh, textual references mainly from the Sanskrit texts and also uh, several texts from the uh, Mesopotamian civilization itself and the kind of uh, music instruments found in Mesopotamian civilization. So this sort of analysis adds much much more value. So I hope uh, this talk uh, will be a very good uh, uh, kind of an, uh, uh, introduction into the possibilities of uh, uh, Harappans carrying their music instruments into the Mesopotamian region and also certain adaptations uh, uh, by the Mesopotamians, Mesopotamians from the Harappans. I hope uh, uh, Mr. Shail Vyas will uh, give a detailed account uh, of the evidences he has uh, uh, found out from various literary as well as the depictions uh, from both Harappan and Mesopotamian civilizations. So this talk, uh, uh, we will have a uh, we'll have the talk of Mr. Shail Vyas. Then we have experts uh, uh, like Dr. Bisht and Professor Vasan Shinde who will also chip in and uh, give their uh, views on the uh, propositions made by uh, Mr. Shail Vyas. I hope all of you will enjoy this talk. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Vien Prabhakar for that fantastic introduction. And uh, I am deeply grateful to Dr. R.S. Bisht and Dr. Vasant Shinde for their time and comments. I would also like to thank uh, Homi Baba Fellowships Council and Executive Director uh, Professor S.M. Chitre for supporting my work. All of this started in uh, 2011 uh, when I was confronted with the uh, colossal problem of Indian music. And the problem was that we don't know much about the history and origin and evolution of uh, our music. And on the other hand, we say that our music is thousands of years old and whatnot. But uh, we don't know what happened in those thousands of years. Then I tried to fight about the ancient period and particularly at that time the golden period of Indian history was uh, my focus. By looking at it, the first thing I understood was uh, it was not possible to quantify uh, the, the, the evolution of music in, in time periods so sharply. This That appeared to me like, like a flow, like a river flowing from the past to the present time. And to understand the flow, uh, I realized that I had to start from the beginning. And that beginning is Indus Valley Civilization in the Indian subcontinent. So that's how uh, this uh, research project started. And since then, I've been working on that. Um, but as a musician, uh, knowing about musical instruments, just knowing about them or looking at a picture or a drawing or a sculpture uh, does not interest me that much. I would like to see what kind of sound that produces. I want to hear the sound. Uh, I would want to uh, see what kind of music is possible with those instruments. So the, the project uh, was shaped not only to discover about the music but to recreate uh, those instruments and to in a way revive them see what kind of sound is possible, uh, what kind of music is uh, could possibly be produced using them. What we have achieved till now in the discovery section is that we studied the archaeological records uh, including iconography, uh, toy forms and likely non-perishable parts of instruments. It's an ongoing process uh, from various industry sites. Uh, it's an ongoing process and uh, we hope to find new things. 
then comparative study of instruments from Indus and Mesopotamian civilization as well as uh, later periods in the Indian subcontinent to understand the nature of possible cultural connections uh, and continuities if there are any. Collectively uh, identification of about 20 uh, possible instruments from Indus Valley has happened by now. I will talk about them in a moment. In the recreation section we have already uh, recreated some of the prototypes um, from Indus Valley civilization and which we also used them in a music video as I was saying the revival part of the study. And uh, in the coming phase, the next phase of the project which is about to start now, uh, we wish to fully recreate all the instruments we have found out about and we are simultaneously working on uh, to find the possible use of these unique instruments, these unique sounds in the contemporary uh, context, in the modern context. So let us watch that video first and then I'll continue. So as you saw, uh, the all uh, all of our three objectives are uh, shown in that uh, video that we, we want to understand the instruments, we want to recreate them uh, and we want to um, uh, put them in a musical context because that's where a musical instrument should be. Uh, that is the right place for an instrument. Some of those instruments you saw in the video are uh, sounding prototypes, some of them are non-sounding prototypes and, but we have used uh, a modern technologies to recreate the sound to uh, like using computer based sound modeling and synthesis and whatnot uh, to approximately uh, reach to approximately reach to the kind of sound that instrument would produce using variety of methods so let us talk about the evidence in Har harappan archaeology what we have found till now in harappan archaeology and then i'll move on to mesopotamia uh, which is the main uh, subject of today's talk 
So we have uh, harps, uh, harps which are seen on seals. There is a uh, sign in the Harappan script which clearly appears uh, to be inspired from an arched harp, a harp shaped like a bow. And uh, then we have ocarinas or vessel flutes, which we which are found miniaturized as toy vessels from uh, various Harappan sites. Then there is there is long drum, long barrel drum. You can see it there, that one. That uh, this uh, this kind of instruments are played all over India, um, from north to south and to east to west. There, there would be variations, but uh, in uh, this instrument is everywhere. Then there is damru, which is also uh, part of script. Uh, there is a shape. There is a sign in the script which uh, appears to be like damru. In fact, there are many signs like that. Some uh, some scholars interpret them as a variation of the same sign and so on and so forth. A very interesting find was a multiple specimen of possible tuning pegs. Uh, I'll talk about that, what is that? Which could be used for lutes and lyres. Uh, then, there, then there are rattles, uh, which are uh, found as terracotta in terracotta. Uh, and also use of pots, use of uh, uh, terracotta and metallic pots as musical instruments, which we see till today everywhere in India. A very important part of uh, classical and folk music of everywhere in India. Here are the vessel flutes. Above you can see the uh, Harappan specimen, the, the toy forms from Harappa. And below are the instruments which are found till today in India, especially in uh, India as well as in Pakistan. Uh, in Sindh, in Gujarat, maybe uh, also in Rajasthan. Now, as you can see, there is not much difference between the Harappan uh, and the and the modern uh, folk instruments, except for the number of holes. Now, number of holes, even Harappans could put number of holes, uh, different number of holes. Now, in this picture, you are seeing the the use of tuning pegs in Indian instruments. Now, in the left, uh, there is Sindhi Sarangi and the tuning pegs are indicated by arrow and on the right above uh, tuning pegs of sitar are shown and below tuning pegs of sarinda are shown such uh, tuning pegs are used in, in large variety of large variety of indian instruments uh, they are used to tie the string I mean, the string is tied uh, on one end to the body of the instrument and on the other end to the tuning peg and tuning of the instrument is adjusted uh, using these pegs, <coughs> the, the tension in the string is adjusted using these pegs to achieve the desired sound or tone, the pitch. Here are the Harappan uh, specimen of such pegs. Uh, as you can see, there are there are many different types of pegs. Uh, there are some more Harappan pegs in the next picture. We also did a, a comparison of damage patterns in Harappan and modern uh, uh, tuning pegs. As, a, as you can see in the picture, that in both uh, Harappan and modern ones, the lower half of the peg is damaged more. Now this happens because this is the part which goes inside the instrument. And since tuning has to be uh, adjusted regularly, so this is the part which gets damaged the most. And just above uh, the lower damaged part, we can see the, the marks of the strings. Now string marks uh, in in both the uh, specimen are at a similar place and they appear quite regular as well because uh, uh, musicians uh, tie their strings quite neatly. Uh, we have also found uh, such pegs made from ivory and bone as well along with uh, terracotta. Uh, I, have, I don't have a picture right now but uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, they also used wooden pegs as well. Uh, but uh, even though there are these, uh, there is, uh, there are these uh, various uh, things uh, which indicate towards uh, uh, presence of many musical instruments in Indus Valley civilization, but presently available evidence still does not give a detailed account of music and musical tradition of civilization as large and uh, urban uh, as Indus Valley. It was the largest urban civilization of its time in terms of area. Uh, so. And there are many reasons behind that. Number one is the perishable nature of materials used in the manufacture of the instrument. Now, um, 
musical instruments are mostly made from wood and leather and all those things these are all perishable material uh, they don't survive another problem is that there is a conspicuous absence of central palaces temples and especially elite uh, elaborate elite burial uh, like we see in mesopotamia or uh, uh, egypt where one would uh, hope to seek better evidence but uh, uh, all of this is absent from indus valley uh, another problem is the standardized nature of the seals which employs animal an animal as main motif and then there is a uh, string of uh, arappan script a short uh, string of arappan script four five signs five signs and that's it so seals also don't give much information about the common life or the music or other other even other things of life in most of the arappan seals but there still are some uh, untapped resources that can bring new new knowledge uh, that is the other contemporary civilizations and cultures with which harappans traded harappan articles and trade connections and even settlements are found uh, far and at far and wide places uh, and most important of them is mesopotamia uh, many many scholars have written about the the kind of relation nature of relation uh, between harappa and mesopotamia harappans uh, traded many many uh, things with uh, to the uh, uh, harappan ships took many things to mesopotamia like uh, 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 exotic animals and dogs and peacocks cocks elephant uh, monkeys uh, precious wood royal furniture precious stones semi precious stones such as carnelian uh, agate lapis lazuli uh, metals like gold and silver and tin wood particularly wood and timber for construction ships and wooden furniture are constantly mentioned as coming from meluha which was the name uh, given by mesopotamians to uh, indus valley civilization or a part of it there are also local settlements of families of specialized uh, uh, merchants and the craft person from indus valley found in mesopotamia uh, like villages or trade enclaves of uh, harappans and maluhans are mentioned consistently in um uh, sumerian um, uh, texts um, as temple overseers and in charge of scribes and craft persons keepers and financiers of uh, sacred garden and what not so what is the possibility of uh, harappan music in mesopotamia arrival of harappan music in mesopotamia now music is uh, fundamental to human as a species a certain percentage of human population is always musically inclined irrespective of their profession and some of them would even be very highly uh, uh, accomplished and music is also an integral part of uh, many social activities you will observe like uh, religious practices um, marriages deaths and uh, what more so due to possible presence of harappan population in mesopotamia and on account of these very natural reasons Uh, possibility of arrival of harappan music in mesopotamia seems likely for no other reason that that is that's uh, that's a very uh, natural occurrence that it would happen now there can be many other possible scenarios as well along with these natural reasons like uh, for long distance uh, trade uh, whether overland or maritime it is likely that traders would keep some means of entertainment with them uh, music importantly music and uh, other performing arts itself is a profession and so is business of making and selling musical instruments now uh, manufacture of musical instruments uh, would not be very different from royal furniture which harappan trade centers were regularly supplying to mesopotamia and the possibility of involvement of harappan craftsmen in the manufacture of musical instruments in mesopotamia is a, is actually a tenable premise and as the evidence suggests could be the case uh, maybe i'll talk about it in about that in the in, in, in later half but what was the situation back home at indus valley now uh, while there is clear evidence of a uh, lot of harappan activity in mesopotamia situation back home was complete surprisingly was completely different uh, there is even hardly a single object of clear west asian origin is excavated uh, has been excavated at any indus uh, site and in the industrial uh, 
therefore many scholars have uh, concluded that any uh, that harappans that harappan groups may have traveled and traded and settled in the west but uh, sumerians did not travel directly to the coasts or plains of indus nor they settled settled at least in substantial uh, groups in the indus cities uh, and another issue is that harappans who uh, settled in mesopotamia probably never came back so the situation thus uh, forces us to conclude that um, any significant mesopotamian impact on the local musical traditions in indus valley is highly unlikely although there can be some uh, musical elements which may uh, have reached here um, and such a find would be equally useful but significant uh, mesopotamian impact on any uh, any uh, significant cultural impact on um, indus civilization from mesopotamia is unlikely now musical instruments have a very peculiar quality Uh, in fact, very unique and uh, a bit majorly overlooked quality, I must say, because <clears throat> when they travel to other places, uh, many a times their names travel with them. Now, just like any other technical term, uh, for example, guitar, or violin, or harmonium, especially harmonium, which is the which has become the part of Indian music. Harmonium is used in uh, uh, classical music. It is used in folk music, but uh, they are called with the same names harmonium is still called harmonium everywhere in india therefore if harappan musical instruments uh, indeed reached mesopotamia uh, then it is uh, possible that some of their names uh, some of their indian names uh, may also have got recorded in the text in mesopotamia uh, which is um, and as we know uh, languages or the and the uh, scripts of uh, mesopotamia has been deciphered so that could be studied now uh, while musical tradition is not directly or specifically related to language but uh, names of instruments are uh, thus any surviving indian names of inst instruments in mesopotamia possibly can give us some clue on the kind of uh, language or the words spoken by harappans uh, but to compare them uh, you see there are uh, there can be some random or uh, coincidental phonetic similarities among the words Uh, between lang between un even unrelated languages, so certain measures were required to identify a positive result. Uh, so the the first measure was that words should not only be phonetically similar, similar, but semantically as well. That is, uh, they are they should have similar meaning as well. So um, it should sound similar and it should mean similar. Only variation within same context were allowed in meaning, like uh, which is a natural occurrence. For example. um a name of the instrument is recorded as a part of instrument or a style of music as is recorded as name of instrument that happens uh, style of performance um, as name of instrument but only occasional uh, variations and within the same context were allowed otherwise uh, uh, phonetic uh, phonetic and uh, semantic similarities had to be there the most important thing that which i i wanted to maintain was uh, the verifiability Uh, so the phenomena to look for was direct word exchange that means uh, there should generally be no need to invoke uh, like proto roots and create unattested uh, combinations using them uh, this is not to suggest such uh, interactions may not have happened but uh, these hypo uh, these hypothetical uh, occurrences were kept deliberately out of the system for a non musical example uh, uh, if i have to give that uh, let's say we find a person name name of a person which sounds indian and it can be made by combining these two sounds or these two roots uh, such uh, occurrence would not be considered as a positive result here and then phonetic variations uh, there would be some phonetic variations but that should be within the scope of usual patterns that are seen in the words uh, in, in other words which we find sumerian was chosen first uh, to be studied uh, because this was the language which was spoken in the Meso in, in mesopotamia In at least in the large uh, larger part of Mesopotamia, when the relationship between Harappa and Mesopotamia started and flourished, only later uh, uh, in the late centuries of third millennium BC, when Akkadian language language started to spread after uh, conquest of Sargon of Akkad. 
uh, and Sumerian was still spoken, uh, not that it was immediately extinct, but it was still spoken, creating, in fact, creating uh, an area of uh, linguistic convergence. Uh, only in the later period, uh, after uh, maybe in around early century, after early, early centuries of uh, second millennia BC, Sumerian gradually extinct as a spoken language, but it was still preserved as a classical language. So uh, Sumerian uh, 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 terms uh, in the categories like musical instruments, uh, musicians, singers, uh, notations, etc. were compared to uh, names of instruments found in early Sanskrit text as well as early Dravidian uh, texts, uh, as well as some other terms like Santhali, uh, terms from Santhali music, uh, but mainly from Sanskrit and Dravidian. And uh, as the study commenced, uh, Sumerian terms started showing uh, similarities or affinities with the, the terms recorded in the earliest early Sanskrit texts. Uh, early Sanskrit is the language of the oldest uh, uh, text uh, found in South Asia. Uh, they are written in the same geographical area as that of uh, Harappan civilization. So without further ado, I will first show what, uh, what similar terms are found, then I will talk about it more. So you can see in the table, uh, Sanskrit terms are given, then Sumerian, then Sanskrit meaning and Sumerian meaning. Uh, as you can see, Varn, uh, it's a Rigvedic word, Varn, Sumerian is Baan. Both mean exactly the same, arched half. Sanskrit term is Dindima, Sumerian is Dindima, a kind of drum, a musical instrument. Sanskrit is Mrija, Sumerian is Meze, a kind of drum, a drum. Sharkara, Sanskrit term is Sharkara. Sumerian is Shukarak, a kind of drum. Sumerian meaning is a musical instrument. Damru, uh, Sumerian terms is, term is Dimarshu, a sacred drum as we all know. It is an instrument uh, related to Shiva. And Sumerian meaning is a musical instrument. Sanskrit term is Mangalturiya. Sumerian is Malgatum, an instrument played at festivals uh, in Sanskrit. Sumerian meaning is a musical instrument. Sayamturiya, Sumerian is Sabittum. Gatyuturya, Sumerian is Mirittum. And meanings are continuously very very similar, in fact quite same in fact actually. Shamya, Sanskrit term, Sumerian is Shamusha. Sanskrit meaning is a kind of symbol or other musical instrument. Sumerian meaning is a type of instrument. Sanskrit is Swara, a musical notation. Sumerian is Sangara, a musical notation. Shadaja, in Sanskrit, Sumerian is Sagida. A musical notation, a musical notation. Gargara, Sanskrit term. Sumerian is Har Har or Gargara, Gargara. A musical instrument, a musical instrument. Kinnara, uh, Sanskrit term. Sumerian is Nara. As we all know, uh, Kinnaras are a class of anthropomorphic uh, musicians and singers. And Sumerian meaning, meaning is a musician and singer. Sanskrit is Gatra or Gala. Sumerian term is Gala. Sanskrit meaning is a singer, a musical instrument and a throat. And Sumerian meaning is a lamentation singer. Stavitra and Sumerian term is Ashtalu, a praiser or a singer in Sanskrit and Sumerian meaning is a type of singer. So there are about uh, 60 uh, terminologies related to music in Sumerian dictionaries out of which about 30 are found to be very similar to Sanskrit in sound and meaning but with an apparent Sumerianization as, as we saw in all of these examples, uh, most of these examples, that uh, terms were little Sumerianized. This was very actually very surprising to me uh, that uh, so many of terms, about 50% of terms uh, were found to be similar. But uh, surprisingly, while uh, there, are, there were similar instruments found in Dravidian musical sphere and even the similar cultural symbolism was also present, but the Dravidian names of those instruments did not uh, match or did not uh, um, uh, show a resemblance that much uh, to Sumerian uh, words. In fact, um, barring uh, just a couple of terms, which uh, two were found in both Dravidian and Sanskrit languages uh, and that two were of Sanskrit origin. Another very uh, in fact, clinching uh, evidence came from the uh, brief study of musical skills. Uh, in Mesopotamia, musicologists have studied musical skills and they are all heptatonic. Uh, that means having seven notes and they are descending in order. Now in India, the oldest known scale is of Samved. Samved uh, 
the scale of sound wave is again heptatonic and is descend descending. Interestingly, it is one of those uh, seven um, Mesopotamian scales mentioned by uh, Ann Kilmer found in Mesopotamia. So, whereas in Dravidian, uh, early Dravidian texts, the scales are pentatonic, that is having five notes. They don't have uh, seven notes. In fact, only later in later period uh, in Dravidian literature, uh, scales of seven notes start to appear. But the interesting part is this summarization, which uh, in a way appeared to me similar to phonosemantic matching. Now, what is phonosemantic matching? Phonosemantic matching is the incorporation of a word into one language from another, often creating a neologism, uh, that is a new word, where the word's non-native quality is hidden by replacing it with phonetically and semantically similar words or roots from the adopting language. Thus, the approximate sound and meaning of the original expression in the source language are preserved, although the new expression in the target language may sound native. And that is what we are seeing in these words that they, if, look, if you look at them in isolation, they appear like Sumerian words. But uh, only when we compare, we see that they are similar to the terms, uh, musical terms found in Sanskrit texts. There are, there are some other examples like that. Uh, one, one very famous uh, example is, the, is about a man named Lu Sun Zida, uh, a man of Maluha. Uh, it's a very, very popular example. Who, uh, and the text, text says that he paid to his servant Urur. Uh, 10 shekels of silver for uh, silver as a payment uh, for a broken tooth in a clash and uh, the, the name Lu Sunzida literally means man of just buffalo cow now man of just buffalo cow although rendered in Sumerian uh, but according to the scholars uh, who worked on that uh, it does not make any sense in Sumerian cultural sphere and must be a translation of Indian name now, um, we don't know the original, uh, the original form of this word, Lu uh, Sunzida. We don't know this original form of this name. So, it cannot be verified that whether or not it was phonetically and semantically similar to the Indian name. But that is not the case with the terms found in this study. Because we know the, uh, the, the, the words in both the languages and we can compare them. And we know that they, they are, uh, they, they, uh, they have phonetic similarities and uh, semantic sim similarities as well. But as you may have noticed that uh, in uh, in Sumerian, uh, most of the terms are mentioned as a musical instrument, a musical instrument. So most of them are not, uh, while they are recorded, but they are not, uh, the exact instrument instruments are not identified and musicologists have talked about this, that uh, these are these, this long list of musical instruments found in the Sumerian records, but uh, it's very difficult to identify which instrument it is. Now, since we have 30 of these words, so we could do a comparative study. So, curiously, that study suggested and demonstrated certain patterns in the way these words were sovereignized in terms of uh, handling of phonemes and word structures that are not compatible with Sumerian. For example, compared to Sanskrit, Sumerian has only about uh, 16 to 18 consonants and uh, about 4 uh, vowels. Now, Sumerian is not uh, understood that well. And there is a debate about the exact number of uh, consonants and vowels and their exact uh, phonetic uh, value. Um, but still, they, uh, they are far lesser than Sanskrit. They are, so, uh, uh, depending on how you count in Sanskrit, there are 33 uh, consonants and 11 or 14 vowels. It is possible that some part of it could be a necessity of this uh, Sumerian, uh, Sumerianization process uh, to make them expressible in the cuneiform script. And apart from these uh, issues of number of consonants and vowels, but there are other inherent limitations too in, in Sumerian. Uh, like no word in Sumerian can have uh, two or more consecutive consonants in the beginning or the end of the word and not more than two anywhere in the word, word uh, which is not the case with Sanskrit where we have uh, uh, compounds and compounds like three and pra and whatnot and uh, half syllables uh, like vowel, which are like consonant without any vowel and th there are clusters of them in many words in the beginning in the end um, anywhere so uh, so let us uh, for the uh, for this purpose of, for the purpose of this study let us call them non compatibles all these uh, consonants vowel issue as well as these uh, word structure related issues
but the closer study of these musical terms suggested that there was some there was a certain consistency in the process of sonorization uh, which was evident in majority of cases uh, so much so that it could it, it could be loosely put in a formula as you can see on the screen uh, it goes like the sanskrit you take the sanskrit word and the removal of non compatibles and replace them with the closest sumerian uh, phoneme morpheme or root or word and the final word is sent, is rendered in sumerian that's how it appeared uh, in the comparative study that this is what was happening and apart from this a uh, sort of uh, global theme there are, there are some other intermittent sub patterns uh, which were also observed like clipping uh, where the one or more sounds are removed from the beginning or the end of the word initial or the final clipping as uh, like telephone so we call it uh, we call phone uh, which is a clip form of the telephone or it net for internet uh, varsity for university and so on there is another interesting pattern which were uh, which was observed was which i call tum pattern uh, i'll talk about it with examples so here are some examples which uh, explain these these patterns which are found uh, sanskrit word is dindima and sumerian is dimdima here this half na in dindima is uh, non compatible and rest of the word remains the same uh, mrija uh, and sumerian word is meze now uh, in again this mri combination in the beginning this ri is actually a vowel in sanskrit which is not present in sumerian as well as j is also not present in sumerian It's, but z z sound uh, maybe z or z is present interestingly uh, while mrija is shown as a lexical entry in sans sanskrit dictionaries but a somewhat upbranch kind of a form which could probably a later form muraja is attested in mahabharat and natya shastra another example is salika now here we see a, a pattern called clipping as i was talking about the uh, sanskrit word is salika and sumerian word is sali now such uh, combinations are seen in sanskrit and indo other indo aryan languages themselves like bhumi bhumika jeev 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 jeevika etc but here probably it is uh, the the removal of ka in the end could be an example of clipping or truncation uh, truncation or shortening which is called in this particular case uh, Uh, it is the final clipping and which is the loss of one or more sounds from the end of a word clipping is as i said clipping is seen in many examples here there are no non compatibles otherwise so no change in the word another example of clipping is kinnara and sumerian term is nara here it is initial clipping uh, and only the final part of the word is retained there is lot to talk about this uh, because of the phenomenon of being anthropomorphic uh, musician which which I, i have worked a lot in this study uh, for anthropomorphic musicians and zoomorphic musical instruments but possibly we won't have that much time to discuss uh, maybe a second part a part 2 of this lecture would be needed for that but my um, preprint of my paper is available uh, you can check there here is another term which i did not discuss earlier is ajkar shiva's bull uh, and sumerian uh, corresponding term is alangar uh, which is a musical instrument bull lyre uh, identified by many uh, musicologists uh, here again we see the same phenomena happening j is not present in sumerian and that's why it is uh, changed and k to g or k to ng is very commonly seen in many examples here um, again forming a pattern aaj ka to alangar not only fits well according to the formula but also importantly to the tradition of naming instruments in india where names are very descriptive for example which uh, um, give information additional information about the shape of instrument or the sound of instrument or uh, metal materials used in manufacture now for for the uh, for example similar to this are uh, kachapi now is a kachapi is a lute uh, shaped like a tortoise uh, similarly uh, there is mayuri uh, a lute shaped like a uh, mayur that is a peacock Um, there are instruments like nagfani um, uh, a wind instrument shaped like a snake so on and so forth here is another example stavitra which becomes stalu now uh, the with the, the the final part of the word vitra is completely non compatible because v v sound is not present in sumerian and the tra is of course uh, another problem 
so it becomes tal uh, another example is swara which becomes sangara again swa is a cluster of um, uh, syllables in the beginning which is which cannot happen in sumerian and va in any way is not present so it becomes sangara this is another very interesting example which i was talking about tum pattern uh, mrityu turiya becomes mrittu now uh, uh, when there is a word which is very complicated from sumerian uh, perspective uh, like this one mrityu turiya the, the mri and the tu and turiya all these are uh, 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 these word structures are not present in sumerian and in in these in, in similar words like this uh, when where the ending of the word uh, has a chunk of non compatibles so which is seemingly replaced by tum or lum or hum hum in many many words uh, 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 whenever there is a very complicated word and ending is also non uh, non compatible and uh, so ending is usually replaced with tum lum hum or um kind of uh, sounds similar case is sayam turi which becomes sabitum uh, and mangal turiya uh, malgatu so as you saw these patterns are quite consistent and uh, i'll just give couple of other examples and move towards the uh, next uh, part of the talk uh, sanskrit sindhu a rag in while it is name of uh, the indus river but it is also a rag in indian classical music uh, there are other ragas like sindhu bhairavi sindh uh, sindhi bhairavi sindh sindhura sindhura bhairavi now these are all similar names but they are different ragas and they are found in uh, both north and south indian classical music and they are also many of them are also a part of long standing folk traditions of rajasthan and sindh and uh, punjab and what not and similarly we find in sumerian uh, endu a song endu ana a song endu gargar a composer now gargar is uh, is a, a, an instrument mentioned in rigved uh, endu dugdu a chanter now while all these terms are fully verifiable in both the languages but it could be confirmed further so if these findings were correct about the kind of cultural impact this list suggests uh, that 50% of uh, sumerian terms found were found similar to sanskrit then there must be more words in sumerian records pertaining to the other fields or activities for which there is a direct or indirect um, evidence for harappan involvement of some kind and which also belong to the same underlying language as these musical terms that is sanskrit and they all and which also exhibit similar patterns in the uh, process of sumerization so uh, many more words were studied uh, which which are related to trade and uh, harappan trade and other things uh, let us get into that first of all units of measurement now harappan style weights are found not only in mesopotamia but also in bahrain uh, oman etc in archaeological records and same appears to have reflected in sumerian texts as well um sanskrit man sumerian man uh, so in sanskrit it means a particular measure or weight and uh, in sumerian it is the same meaning a unit of weight sanskrit is kol which is unit of again unit of weight sumerian is kil again unit of weight now uh, here uh, as you can see the o becomes i uh, the o uh, o vowel is not present in sumerian so non compatible which which gets replaced by i we have seen this in many examples o get replaced by either u or e etc sanskrit drona sumerian dan again here dra is a non compatible sound so is na but na to na is very very common and it becomes and o again o is here which is also not compatible so it becomes dan goni sanskrit goni uh, a unit of weight and uh, sumerian is gun again we see o becomes u and ana becomes na sanskrit krosh a measure of distance which common which is commonly called kos uh, and sumerian is kush and same phenomena is present here tra in the beginning is non compatible and o so it becomes kush and what is striking here is that all these words uh, related to unit of measurements um of which some examples i presented there are more than um, there are more uh, uh, mentioned in my manuscript uh, it is striking that uh, all the words related to units and measures are attested in mesopotamia since early uh, since early dynastic periods and are mostly attested very very well 
The next category is trees, woods, wooden furniture or related words. And now as quoted, quoted earlier, the trees and timber for construction, uh, woods and timber for construction, uh, ships and wooden furnitures are consistently mentioned as coming from Mel Meluha in Sumerian accounts. At the same time, it uh, gives us a unique opportunity because trees give uh, independent um, evidence uh, based on their natural habitat. So I gave uh, much more than warranted time to that. And importantly, tree woods are also used in making musical instruments. So here are the words which are found. Uh, first of all, the most famous example, the mess tree or mesu in Akkadia. Now the Sanskrit word which is uh, found uh, similar to, to that is meshi, the, the tree Dalbergia uginensis or Ujjain desmodium or desmodium uginensis, Ujinia uginensis. In Hindi it is called sandan uh, which comes from Sanskrit san, syandan, um, not to confuse with chandan that is sandal uh, and many other names. Now uh, it is uh, mentioned as coming from Melua in, at many places in Sumerian um, accounts and very, as I said, very popularly cited example. But it was not identified clearly yet. And uh, so is the case with all the other trees which are found in this study, um, that uh, many people have mentioned them, uh, they are, uh, but uh, identification wasn't clear till now. So it was even more important to uh, study them in great detail, and which I did. About this tree, uh, the Meshi, uh, J.S. Gamble in uh, a manual of Indian timber in first published in 1881 and later in 1972 again and I quote This very pretty and useful tree is a valuable one in India. The wood is much in request for agricultural implements such as plows and being tough and strong it is usually it is useful for carriage building. It makes excellent furniture. Uh, Roxburg mentions that the pillars of Maharaja Sindhya's palace in Ujjain are made of it. Uh, so that's where probably the name Dalmarigya uginensis comes from. The, the timber of this species is is, is very well uh, considered highly valuable and considered to be superior to teak, uh, uh, Tectona grandis in terms of shock resistance and sheer strength and hardness. It is also a specialty timber for marine plywood, uh, which is important here. This tree is native to Indian subcontinent only and it is found in almost whole of northern and uh, central India and into the greater part of Deccan Peninsula. Um, it's uh, Interestingly, its bark is sometimes black, grey or dark brown and hence in Hindi and Marathi the tree is also known as uh, Kala Palash or Kala Palas uh, respectively, uh, literally a, a, a black palash tree, uh, Butia Manosperma, uh, with which it bears some similarities. Interestingly, in Mesopotamian text too, mess is occasionally referred to as black tree. But more interestingly, uh, <clears throat> it has a lot of uh, Sanskrit names, more than 25 I found uh, in, uh, in Sanskrit records. In Rig Veda, it is mentioned as Spandan uh, in, in context of parts of chariot. And uh, several other names are derived, uh, there are several other names of history derived from wooden objects like that and which suggests its preferential use in uh, manufacture of those uh, objects. I'll show you the table as you can see on the screen now. Uh, there I've given the, the other Sanskrit names of Meshi and what it is uh, derived from. Syandana, Syandandruma, Syandani which comes from Syandana, a war chariot, chariot or car. Akshaka, Akshika, Akshika comes from Aksh and Axel, Axis, Wheel, Cart, Car, Beam, Chariot, etc. Chakrin, uh, which comes from Chakra, Wheel. Nemi, Nemin comes from Nemi, the felly of a wheel or any circumference or edge or rim. Uh, Ratha, Rathadru, Rathadruma, Rathika comes from obviously Rath, a chariot car, especially two-wheeled war chariot. Uh, Shakata, uh, the, tree, the, the tree is called Shakata and Shakata means a cart, wagon, car, carriage, again the same thing. So, so consequently it is called chariot tree in English. As you can see in the pictures, uh, it, it becomes full of flower when, when in full bloom. Intriguingly, as stated earlier, uh, Harappans are also mentioned as keepers and financiers of sacred gardens and uh, 
one of the term uh, uh, one of the terms for garden in sumerian and akkadian is san, uh, sandana or sandanaku uh, that's very very interesting uh, uh, there are also other records where uh, uh, this tree in, uh, in in mesopotamia where uh, which shows that tree was probably planted uh, there it's uh, again interestingly it leaves are trifoliate and uh, as we know and it is worth uh, noting that trifoliate designs are present in harappan art and the script harappan art in harappan art and script uh, and similar designs are also found in mesopotamia and uh, usually considered uh, and and uh, many a times considered as uh, harappan influence um, which many scholars like bishta and others have uh, mentioned so no wonder if harappan used and brought this multi purpose tree with them to west but unfortunately unfortunately today in india timber exploitation has degraded the natural stand of this species and um, which is very sad part but oddly despite having much uh, importance historically as suggested by its many many sanskrit names uh, the tree seems to have this particular tree seems to have eluded scholarly attention till now in the studies related to these subjects the next one is shinshapa or shanshap tree the tree dalbergia sissu uh, the shisham uh, very well known uh, wooden uh, very 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 well known tree and wood uh, i won't uh, go in detail about that uh, we all i'm sure you all know about that but very importantly it is highly regarded in manufacture of musical instruments uh, for its superior acoustic qualities and durability and uh, with tradition not only traditionally in india for folk and classical instrument but as well as all around the world today Uh, in fact it is one of the most widely used uh, woods in guitars and other instruments the next tree is asan the tree uh, terminalia tomentosa uh, known as indian laurel as asin asin sen en saz as aisan etc uh, uh, and sumerian uh, corresponding term is ac the tree a tree uh, again it is mentioned to come from melua in sumerian records uh, this this particular uh, asan tree is uh, perhaps the most widely distributed of all the important indian forest trees and one of the most universal employ for the uh, building of the native houses and other uh, country purposes um, again it is found in um, uh, in north india as well as both the peninsulas um, its wood is used for furniture cabinet work uh, joinery paneling uh, specialty items boat building um, etc decorative veneers for musical instruments um, <clears throat> interestingly silk worm feed on its leaves and produce tussar silk uh, which is uh, which is a commercially important wild silk um, there are other usage of this tree such as bark its bark and fruits are used for dye and tanning leather etc uh, the next one is uh, abj uh, sanskrit abj the tree abj the tree barringtonia acutangula the sumerian corresponding term is abak or ges abak now ges ab ges is a, a a prefix which is added uh, to show it's a tree um, it is mentioned to come again mentioned to come have come from melua barringtonia acutangula is native to indian subcontinent afghanistan and southeast asia um, uh, and uh, commonly known as mangrove uh, itchy tree mango pine indian oak etc and it is found on river banks swampy sites and rocky sand shores uh, sanskrit abj literally means uh, born in water and it has many other names in sanskrit that are related to water like uh, nadija jalaja ambuja samudra phala literally sea fruit uh, but uh, similarly on the account of sumerian abb meaning sea it has sometimes been translated as sea wood uh, that's very very interesting Yeah, uh, it is used for boat building, well construction for making rice pounders, uh, cabinets, carts, etc. Again, there are other medicinal usage of uh, fruit and bark, etc. The next is uh, Sanskrit kurcha, a bunch of anything, bundle of grass, etc. Often used as a seat, uh, and corresponding Sumerian term is guza. Now here, Akkad or Akkadian form is kusu. again it is mentioned to come from uh, mentioned to have come from Mal maluha in sumerian records uh, if we see the sumerianization process here the k to k to uh, k to g is very commonly seen as i have shown in another example and the ending of the uh, the the word rch rch is the, the the last part is completely non compatible ch is not present in sumerian in any ways 
But Akkadian form Kusu makes it even more clearer. But important thing here is that the Sanskrit word Kurcha has most archaic and broad meaning for anything to be used as a seat. Uh, and the word seems to have spread in far and wide places and popularly used for chair till today. For example, Marathi, Kurch, Kurchi, Hindi, Kursi, Gujarati, uh, Khurashi, Telugu, Kurchi, Malayalam, Kashera, Indonesian Kursi, Khmer, Kawai, Arabian Kursi, uh, Chinese Yizzi, uh, etc. Malay, Kerusi, uh, Ukrainian Kristlo. Now, word Kursi and its variation are usually thought to have come from Arabic Kursi, but Akkadian and Sumerian records uh, evidently show its uh, uh, Kusu as we saw in Akkadian and uh, Kusa in Sumerian. They evidently show its existence well before that and its relation with Melu. There are many other terms in, in, in this area as well, but uh, I'll just give just a couple of more examples. Sanskrit Mangini, boat or ship, Sumerian Magilum, a boat or ship. We again see that Tum Num Um pattern here, Mangini Magilum, identified as coming from Meloa in Sumerian records. Sanskrit Sutrakara, a carpenter, and uh, Sumerian Shukara, carpenter. Sanskrit Ambra, a, a second beam of timber over a door. Uh, Sumerian Ambra or Amru, Deem, Timber, etc. Uh, the next category is Jewelry. I will give only a few examples. Uh, first of all, is the first is Sindhu, Sanskrit Sindhu, and Sumerian Hindu, a bead. Now, Sindhu is the name of Indus River. Harappan beads are found almost all over Mesopotamia and are one of the most important Harappan export uh, attested in archaeology. Now, uh, historically, the variations of the word Sindhu have been used to identify the region, the Indian subcontinent, uh, the uh, the uh, the area beyond and around uh, Sindhu River, uh, its people, its culture, uh, ethnicity, religion, and products. Um, uh, I also found Akkadian words uh, attested in standard Babylonian: uh, Sindhu, Sinda, Sindhu, Sinduja, etc used as adjective Indian, said for Indian wood. Uh, ancient, as uh, you all know, ancient Greeks referred to Indian as Indoi and uh, pe uh, people of Indus, um, Persian used hin Hindu for the same. Next is uh, Har, uh, a garland of pearls, necklace, etc. Uh, Sumerian word is Har, an ornament. Uh, Sanskrit word is Hiranya, any vessel or ornament made of gold. Uh, Sumerian word is Hiryattum. Hiranya, Hiryatum. Again, that uh, Tum pattern comes here. Karnandu, an earring. Uh, Sumerian is Kamkamattum, earring. Sanskrit is Nepatya, ornament or decoration or costume, especially of an actor. And uh, Sumerian term is Nabihum, an ornament. Uh, I'll, disc I I'll quickly discuss some general trade, uh, general trade terms which are found. Uh, most important of them is uh, Mudra, seal. Inscription, mark, gesture, pose, etc. And Sumerian is Musara inscription. Also, Sumerian Mashdara inscription. Um, uh, we all know that seals most likely play, played a very, very important role in Harappan trading uh, methods. And as mentioned uh, by the scholars, that uh, Harappan and Harappan style, Indus style seals are found uh, in Mesopotamia as well. Sarvadang, market, bazaar, stirring town, affair. Sumerian is Shakang, market market price, etc. Sanskrit Nidhimat, containing treasure or forming a store. Uh, Sumerian Nakamtum, storehouse. Sanskrit Goranku, a balesman, guarantee. Sumerian Ginatum, guarantee. Sanskrit Sarga, ascent or agreement. Uh, Sumerian Sega, uh, Shega, agreement. Uh, meaning is the same, agreement. One more term I would like to mention here is uh, Akshadevana, uh, dice playing or gambling. The Sanskrit word Akshad, a game of dice. A corresponding Sumerian term which is found is Akidma, a wooden object used in a game. And uh, in archaeology, Harappan uh, um, dices are found in Mesopotamia as well. There are also some terms found in animals, as, uh, stated, um, as I uh, stated earlier, that uh, uh, Maluhan ships exported many animals to Mesopotamia. I'll just give a couple of examples. Sanskrit Ansakut. Abul's hum, a very important term here. Uh, and Sumerian, Sumerian term is Askubitu, 
अनसकूट अस्कुम भी तुम अगेन तुम पैटर्न इज एविडेंट हियर आई जस्ट गिव वन मोर एग्जाम्पल हियर रोमश और लोमश संस्कृत रोमश और लोमश गोट एंड सुमेरियन मश इनिशियल क्लिपिंग लाइक वी सॉ इन मेनी अदर वर्ड लाइक किन्नरा किन्नर एक्सेट्रा एंड इंटरेस्टिंगली ऑन द सील ऑफ मलोन ट्रांसलेटर वी सी अ फिगर होल्डिंग अ गोट बेबी गोट प्रोबेबली इन इज हैंड सो ऑल मोस्ट ऑफ द वर्ड्स आई डिस्कस टिल नाउ आर रिलेटेड टू द फील्ड्स दैट कैन बी कनेक्टेड विद हरप्पन और साउथ एशिया थ्रू सम वे और दर but uh, given the the influence seen in in the above list uh, there 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 would be many many more there would be many more words uh, related to general human activities which do not get attested in archaeology um, i'll give just a, just a few example examples there it is an ongoing uh, work and uh, a lot more to be studied in in those areas which i have not covered much in uh, uh, till now uh, i'll give just a few examples Uh, one is very interesting example of disease uh, humans do fall ill and so would harappan in mesopotamia these meso harappans i call them so it appears that uh, it appears that some of the indian uh, names of indian disease also got attested we are, right now we are going through a, a very bad pandemic and i hope everyone who is watching is safe and their families are safe i'll i'll just uh, show a couple of examples here uh, adhimansaka sanskrit term is adhimansaka sumerian is amuddaseki अंगज संस्कृत अंगज सुमेरियन अगनगर संस्कृत अजगल्लिका गोट्स चीक और इन्फेंटाइल डिजीज सुमेरियन अगिंजल अ डिजीज संस्कृत अग्निदाह अ पर्टिकुलर डिजीज सुमेरियन अगंतुम इट इज मैं स्किन डिजीज देर आर समर वर्ड लाइक स्नेह एंड सुमेरियन सिमिलर टर्म विच आई फाउंड वॉज स्नेह मुद जॉय संस्कृत मुद जॉय सुमेरियन मुद जॉय एक्जैक्टली सेम वर्ड नो चेंज नथिंग उमा संस्कृत उमा फेम रेपुटेशन स्प्लेंडर लाइट एंड ऑल्सो वाइफ ऑफ शिव शिव कम्स अगेन एंड अगेन यर कॉल्ड पार्वती और दुर्गा एंड सुमेरियन उमा ट्रायम्फ विक्ट्री संस्कृत मह और मह सुमेरियन मह एग्जैक्टली सेम मीनिंग ग्रेट टू बी ग्रेट स्ट्रॉन्ग पावरफुल सेम मीनिंग सेम वर्ड इन बोथ द लैंग्वेजेस so these are the list of words i i have some i have given gave some example there are many more total uh, there are total 90 words uh, 90 such words are found till now mm, i'll give just uh, quickly my observation about uh, all these words uh, first thing is that this data is statistically significant and uh, found and bulk in the areas where harappan words were likely to be found um, and their period of attestation uh, in mesopotamia that is from early dynastic period to uh, old babylonian this is the period of uh, like from early dynastic through akkadian and till old babylonian all of the words which are meant uh, which i have uh, uh, found are from this uh, span of the period which corresponds with harappan presence in uh, mesopotamia and correspond well with the harappan presence in mesopotamia in archaeology uh, and the qualitative analysis of this uh, list suggest that they may belong to a fairly advanced or urban kind of a culture which is uh, an approximately same period is the uh, mature urban phase of the harappan civilization majority of words which are found in this study are technical terms that for uh, that is jargon as we call them uh, musical terms measuring units trade related terms now there can be some random or coincidental similarities uh, but it is not likely for technical terms to be very similar and bulk in unrelated uh, languages without borrowing uh, without some kind of borrowing for example uh, without some kind of direct influence it could be highly unlikely that 50% of the uh, music related terms in sumerian dictionary would be very similar in sound and meaning to those found in in a linguistically linguistically and geographically unrelated language this is way beyond some random coincidence uh, or uh, something like that so a direct contact would be very very crucial to account for such an uh, such an occurrence now for these words to have come from mesopotamia to south asia there should be at least some archaeological evidence found uh, in harappan sites accounting for such a degree of influence from mesopotamia uh, such influence cannot happen without people uh, in 
people migrating uh, from some place to another uh, and for which uh, and, and, and there should be uh, evidence of the kind we see in Mesopotamia uh, for Harappan presence. Uh, and just like the nature of relationship between Indus and uh, Mesopotamia, the, the, the formula which, which came out after studying the, 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 the patterns, um, two appears to be one-way ticket. That means uh, it, is, uh, it is possible to obtain uh, or uh, at least approximate Sumerian terms from Sanskrit uh, term, but uh, other way around doesn't seem possible because the words are clipped, uh, parts are removed. So that makes it very difficult for uh, these words uh, coming from Mesopotamia to South Asia directly or indirectly. In the most significant part, several words are related to items that are either native to South Asia or known to have reached Mesopotamia through Harappans. For example, hump bull, uh, we saw uh, bull's hump and uh, species of trees and woods, units of measurement, seals and beads and uh, dice and uh, wooden furniture and uh, monkey. I did not discuss monkey, but there is monkey also. Uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, it, it directly connects it to Harappan civilization and, and South Asia. Some words are specific to India from Indo-European perspective as well. And that means they are not related to, uh, the, the corresponding terms are not present in any other Indo-European Indo uh, language. For example, musical terms like Vaan and Gargara and Bhand, uh, uh, units of measurement like Kosh or Goni, uh, Dice, the word for Dice, Aksh or Shand, uh, the priest we, we found. And as we all seen, the words are Indo-Aryan in nature, which is the language of the oldest known uh, text uh, in from South Asia and pertain to the same geographical area as that of Indus civilization. Um, there, this is and this is an ongoing work. There's a lot more to uh, do, and uh, I, I would really really like that everyone watching this uh, uh, to come up with your with your suggestions, ideas. This data should be uh, debated, uh, talked about so that more and more perspectives can come in. Uh, I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't uh, cover a lot more which, which, uh, which is there in my manuscript, but maybe we'll do a part two and uh, I'll talk about iconography, which I couldn't touch at all uh, and comparative study of cultural traditions and whatnot. There is a lot more in that. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you. Chad Vyas has indeed done a very remarkable research in the field of archaeomusicology of Indus civilization and also its relation with the Mesopotamian civilization of the third millennium BCE. Both were contemporary civilization and both were in bisque trade relations. But I mean, the, he has gone beyond that. He has not only confirmed that, but he has gone beyond that also. Uh, and he has tried to find um, certain thing which are very similar, which has very similar or seems to be, I mean, the, borrowed by that civilization or this civilization during that period. Harappan civilization is indeed was a great civilization, one of the great urban civilizations of the third million BC. We know a, lo a lot, lot more in respect of many aspects of that civilization, but unfortunately very little is known about their music. A civilization of this status of Indus civilization cannot be devoid of any music or musical instruments. So with that object, Sher Vyas had done very remarkable job in the sense that he delved deep into the archaeological records and found, found out many very special items which were certainly the part of or special components of ancient instruments. Otherwise, we know very little about the instruments of the Harpa civilization, uh, barring a few things like drum and all those things. But he, he has found um, not only the tuning packs, whistle, whistle birds, rattles, and so many other things also, 
and I mean the uh, indeed I mean the he has uh, uh, broken new ground, has given a new direction, uh, or a new direction, uh, and added a new uh, dimension to Harappan studies. Indeed, uh, uh, so far his contact with the Mesopotamian civilization is is concerned. Ships from India were going to Mesopotamia. Taking along with the uh, goods and all other things, uh, timber, precious metals, special, uh, uh, very special kind of semi precious stones, and so many other things. Some of the things were perishable, just like wood or timber. And he, he had done a remarkable work in, in that field also. We, we archaeologists knew pretty well that a variety of timber was exported from India to Mesopotamia. But since the timber was, was perishable, so nothing is found of uh, that, I mean, the, there or here. Luckily, there are certain words which have been uh, mentioned, recorded by several scholars. But unfortunately, those trees were remained unidentified. He has done a human service by identifying those with the help of the Sumerian dictionaries, Akkadian dictionary, and Sanskrit dictionary, and, uh, and uh, literature of the forestry, uh, of forest produce and all that of India. And uh, particularly, I would like to make mention of that one a particular wood it was called mesh, which is called meshi, identified as meshi by Shelbias. And he has also collected different names of, of that tree, like Shendan, Spandan, Chakrin, Rathin, all those terms, uh, all, most of them indicate that they were being used for making chariots, wagons, and boats, and uh, such things. It was very useful wood for making furniture also. And it was a medicinal plant having a very beautiful white flowers. That tree is planted as a flowering tree also. And uh, Shail Bias has found some references to it uh, in the Mesopotamian text that it was possibly planted in the gardens of Mesopotamia. That is very remarkable. In addition to that, he has also identified many other things like mangrove, like asan, uh, like uh, uh, dalveria, sisu, shisham, so many other timbers uh, which, are, which are found, they are mentioned in the Mesopotamian records. And all those trees are grown here in India. And we know that Mesopotamia is very deficient in. Uh, wood. Since I mean, the, we were in relation with them, so it's very easy for for them to import it from India. And uh, apart that, I mean, the, he has he has found many many such terms, which uh, the indicative of that not only the timber but many other things were also being transported there, because those are. Their origin has been traced to Melukha. Melukha was the ancient name given to, given by Mesopotamia to Indus civilization. Since um, the, their text is specifically of the third million BC record that these things were being brought from Melukha or India, so we can well like uh, think that those things were, were went there by trade. Maritime, mostly maritime trade. Uh, after uh, doing a lot of work on the Mesopotamian text and uh, Indian archaeological records, he also wanted to consult our most ancient Sanskrit literature, like the Vedic literature, partic particularly the Rig Veda, to begin with, and then came down to later Vedas also, because they are the oldest written records. 
here. And he found very interesting long list of such names, which, could, which, which belong to musical, musical instruments, music, musical uh, tones, notes, and so many things. So indeed, I must congratulate Shail Vyas for his remarkable research, for his path-breaking, path-making research. And I mean, the it, uh, Indian archaeology will, will, uh, will benefit a lot once his research is published. I wish him all, all the best. The discovery of the Harappan civilization in 1920s and subsequent identification of this civilization in 1924 is considered to be one of the greatest archaeological events in 20th century. There are two reasons for this. One is that you know, before the discovery of the Harappan civilization, it was all, always considered by most of the historians, particularly British historians, that there is a big gap in the history of the country. Vincent Smith in the beginning of 20th century wrote that India jumps from Stone Age to the Stupa period or the Buddhist period. But the discovery and identification 1924 pushed back at one stroke the settled life in this part by almost 3000 years. We have done a lot of uh, maybe reconstruction of the lifestyle of the Harappans. Today we know about you know various facets of the life of the Harappans because you know we have so much data from number of Harappan sites. We also know about the basic craft that was introduced by the Harappans. We know about their socio-political, religious organizations, economic organizations, their trade contacts with Mesopotamia, Egypt, Persian Gulf, even with Central Asia also. So, but what we are not done in fact, or what we do not know, is about the musical system that the Harappans may have introduced in this part. I, I always believe that the Harappans are the founders of the Indian culture and Indian tradition. And there is a continuity in that, in the traditions and the cultures. Uh, so they have introduced many basic traditions and concepts, including maybe the yoga science, maybe natural science, health science, etc. But nobody thought that you know, Harappans also could have introduced the musical system and they may have used some musical instruments. Now, in this respect, Shail Bias has done tremendous work, in fact, he has made tremendous contribution. Now, he is the first scholar who has identified, you know, maybe the concept of a musical system in the Harappan times and he has also identified number of instruments. And some of the instruments were based on maybe their maybe uh, pottery system, maybe some other system. And possibly, you know, these people, since they had close contact with the Mesopotamians, I think a lot of musical instruments which are, which are found uh, on the seals of the, you know, Mesopotamian, you know, culture, on their walls and on the sculptures, a lot of them probably were originated in fact in the you know, Indian subcontinent, they were introduced by the Harappans and possibly because of the exchange, because of the trade contact and exchange of ideas, perhaps these concepts were borrowed by the Mesopotamians. So this is a very, very important uh, concept about which, you know, we had no made, we had not really made any efforts in, you know, unraveling this part of the or this facet of the Harappan culture and Harappan civilization. So this is a very important attempt made by Shail Vaz and these type of studies, you know, which is supported by the archaeological data, genetic data. Now, this type of research needs to be carried forward and uh, 
I think you know the government and various organizations they need to come forward and support these type of efforts made by shell buyers. For last hundred years after the discovery of the Harappan civilization we have been trying to understand the language and the script of the Harappans but so far there is no success. The same DNA research that I did is very significant because for the first time we have scientific data to establish that the Harappans were the indigenous people and there is a continuity in the ancestry from Harappans till the present day without any break. Harappans also develop maritime contacts, maritime trade with different countries like Mesopotamia, Iran, Egypt, etc. It is quite likely that you know, they also carried their cultural elements with them, they also carried their language with them. And I fully agree, in fact, with uh, Shailvas that the Harappans spoke the early form of Sanskrit. And that is reflected, in fact, you know, in the instrument that you know, he has uh, identified. Perhaps you now, when these people established contact with Mesopotamia, probably these elements also went there along with the language. These are the cultural elements you know, which must have gone along with the language. So, you know, more and more research in this field is really required. And I find you no know, very strong potential, in fact, in Shell you know, who can pursue this research and who can lead this to a logical conclusion. So, he needs really support. In fact, you know, both you know, the moral support as well as the financial support for undertaking really a big research on the facets of the Harappan culture which is either not known or known very little. So I wish really you know, great success to Shailvas and uh, we will also of course you know we will support his research and we will certainly encourage him to continue this research in the area which is considered the grey area in Indian history. Thank you very much. We had a, a very good talk uh, by Mr. Shailvas and I really appreciate uh, the efforts undertaken by Shailvas in carrying out a, a deep research into this aspect of uh, music during the third millennium BC and also the uh, possible uh, uh, transformations and adaptations by the Mesopotamians. And I also thank Professor uh, uh, Bisht and also uh, Vasan Shindeji for their uh, uh, views uh, ab about the kind of research carried out uh, by Mr. Shailwes. I hope this will open a, a completely new chapter in understanding the uh, various aspects of the Harappan civilization, uh, the social aspects and uh, the kind of uh, music and musicology during the Harappan civilization. And I hope for uh, several uh, um, more works will add to this. And I also thank all of you for the patient re uh, listening to this talk. and. Uh, and I appreciate uh, any comments, any suggestions uh, uh, that can be uh, sent to us and uh, which we will uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, put before Mr. Shailvras maybe for adding further to his research and also to learn uh, more from the interactions. Thank you. Thank you so much.